We're going to go ahead and get started. Cool. Hi, everybody. Good morning, afternoon. Um, yep, that's after 12. Sorry. First question, difficult question. Before we, I introduce myself, we introduce everybody. How many of you are attending this event for the first time? Good job. It's the first time this event's being done. Trick question. All right, so that's our little icebreaker. <laughs> But I also get a nice shot for the B-roll for the summary video. My name is Bart Farrell. Uh, I am a CNCF ambassador, and I'm currently uh, doing the podcast Cube FM for Learn Kubernetes. If you're interested in sharing your experience about the difficulties and challenges around, um, around working with uh, Kubernetes in all of its forms, please get in touch. Uh, apart from that, content creator from the US originally, but living in Spain for the last 12 years. I ran the data on Kubernetes community from August uh, 2020 to March of this year. And I'm still working in the data space. I'm also an ambassador in the Soda Foundation. I know the, the topic of storage was mentioned in the last talk. I would also like to give a shout out to the previous speaker. Eddie did a really good job. It's going to make our job a little bit harder. Shout out to him. But seriously, that was really good. Yeah. Wow. I think like I've seen a lot of KubeCon talks. Haven't seen one that was laced together so well from a technical perspective, but also very human and creative. Um, so I enjoyed that. I, so that being said, uh, we're going to be talking about the future of, of, data, of database as a service with four well-seasoned folks that are, that are very knowledgeable about, about the ecosystem. I, I told them in our previous call that I would do a quick intro for them, but I also want them just to tell us in 20 seconds about their background experience with database as a service. We'll start out with Oled. I'll share the part that, uh, I, can, that I can tell you is that he founded multiple startups, ex-Googler, ex-excellent basketball player before a career-ending injury, not like the one that happened to Eddie. But take it away, Oded. What's your experience with uh, Database as a Service? Hi. Uh, so my experience with Database as a Service uh, started in my previous company. Uh, and with my previous company, it was very, very hard to scale with, uh, with uh, Redis. Uh, and that's actually why we created uh, DragonflyDB. Very good. Next up, Jordan. Should I jump in? Yep. Okay. Uh, Jordan Tagani, um, co-founder uh, of of a company called MotherDuck. Uh, my uh, start with with databases and services. I helped uh, start uh, Google BigQuery uh, about I don't know, 13 years ago, and um, was an early engineer on the project and led engineering, and then led uh, led product product for a while until I, you know, jumped over to um, to to doing my own thing uh, about a year and a half ago. All right, fantastic. Monica? So I, before that, before this, so I'm of, sorry. I'm of Monica, the founder of a company called Seja, and we are building a data platform on top of Postgres. Uh, my journey started with a few years, seven, eight years of experience in the monitoring space. So I have uh, experience with uh, pushing uh, databases to the limit by storing lots of data. And I started Seja uh, because I started this nonprofit organization and we couldn't find a database that can um, fulfill all our wishes. Um, Good. Okay, um, yeah, and I'm Lisa. Can you hear me? Is this still working or do I need that? I think you're good. Oh, okay. Well, oh, okay, I'll just take this one. Um, hi, I'm Lisa. Uh, I have worked at I think four database companies now. Most recently, for the last three years, I was at CockroachDB. I did not cue Eddie up to say uh, those nice things about Cockroach, but um, I'm a CNCF ambassador, um, and that's who I'm representing here um, today. So I run a really large user group out of the San Francisco Bay Area, and I've been running that user group, um, showcasing end user stories and getting to meet amazing people like Eddie uh, for the last 10 years. So. Um, if you're in the Bay Area and you want to give a talk, hit me up. I might be able to feature you on a big stage. Perfect. Nice introduction. So in terms of the conversation today, we, I'm going to ask the speakers to keep their, their answers relatively concise so that we can have more direct interaction with the audience um, when we do Q&A at the end. But to get started, uh, Oded, if you can answer this question, it's you know, going to be of a significant interest, I'm sure, in KubeCon given what's come up recently in the infrastructure area around Terraform versus OpenTofu. But in terms of open source database providers, how are things evolving in terms of the licensing models? And what does that mean? What's the impact then uh, more broadly for uh, DBAS customers? So uh, I think that uh, we're now seeing for the last uh, few years kind of a shift between uh, regular open source licenses like uh, Apache, 
uh, and MIT towards uh, new licenses like BSL. And I call this uh, shift uh, open source 3.0. And basically, uh, licenses like BSL, you can think of it that they allow you everything. Like you can um, see the code, uh, install it, do whatever you like with it, take it to production. The only thing that you cannot do with that is you cannot run a competing service against the creators of uh, the open source. And, and I think that this is, uh, this is an amazing model for the companies because the companies themselves, they can feel safe about their business model. Every contribution that they do with the code um, goes to all their clients or all their users and not to the competitors. So the developers wins twice. First, more open source is being generated. And second of all, they can use it wherever they like. Um, maybe Lisa, I know that you're, you're very, uh, um, that open source is very close to you. What do you think about BSL licenses? Should it be considered as open source? Wow. Um... Okay, we're at an open source conference and the Linux Foundation and CNCF have very, very strong um, opinions about this. And we just got in this huge debate at All Things Open. I don't know if, he, if someone told you to ask me this question, because um, I, I, not literally, but I pretty much figuratively got tarred and feathered when I suggested that companies like CockroachDB um, and so many other ones out there who have a BSL still should be considered to have an open source product because they have um, you know, the code is very transparent and it's all up there on GitHub and you can actually take it and fork it, but because, and they have an Apache license, but they literally don't have a license that says you can take it, fork it and sell it for commercial use. And apparently I was told that that is the actual definition of being open source. And so, and people feel really, really strongly about this. Luckily, there's good reasons to have a BSL, and it still means your, um, you know, your your company. Uh, you can still be very open. They had 25,000 stars on GitHub because of the transparency, but um, and it's it protects you from, you know, I don't know, the Amazons and you know the the companies that, that you know gives you a three-year head start anyway to keep your um, your proprietary technology safe. Um, but you can still have a serverless version that you offer for free. You can still um, offer databases as a service and support it through a free Slack channel and a free um, Discord channel. And you can go a long way. And you know, like my previous company had an incredibly generous free tier that tens of thousands of users were using. So I would argue they have more open source users with their community edition than they would have people paying for them. But I will leave it up to you all to decide if that makes you an open source company or not. My answer will be a bit different, uh, just a bit of a history. Before I was working for five, six years at Elastic, and I was at Elastic, uh, the company behind the Elastic Search, probably you already are familiar with that. And uh, I know how many discussions we had uh, to about changing license is, I can tell you, was a difficult uh, decision. Um, and you know, there, there was a trend that not only Elastic changed the license, but also MongoDB, Redis, and others. And my opinion is that, you know, you will see that um, more, uh, more older companies, database companies, they change their license, but the new uh, database companies, they didn't. So they have, they use Apache 2 or MIT. Um, but uh, I think it's just a matter of time um, until AWS uh, or other big players, you know, cloud providers are, uh, you know, get making use of their services as you use it. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, they are waiting for those services or those database platforms to be um, kind of successful enough uh, to be able to do the move. So I think in my opinion, it's just a matter of time until database companies in particular will change their license to, um, to a more source available. Um, and I think uh, as a, Personal advice, I think, uh, in order to be protected, I think it's more important to search for other ways. I think it's important to, when you choose your uh, core database, to think about, um, to choose something that has supports an open protocol. I think, in my opinion, the de facto standard uh, protocol for databases is Postgres wire protocol. This is something that it has, um, 
a more open, uh, you know, uh, license. It uh, has a foundation. Um, and I think if, you know, there are lots of database companies that are implementing that protocol, so I think it's easier to, um, to migrate uh, your database to another provider. I think this is the biggest worry that you have to have being locked in to a database provider. All right, Jordan, Mother Duck? Yeah, so I've got a slightly different different take on it. Um, and I think one of the reasons that, you know, people have felt the need to have these these other these other licenses um, is is a side effect of the way that open source companies tended to get tended to get funded. Is you know, you start, you build the open source product, you get a lot of uh, you get a lot of usage and a lot of excitement around it, uh, and then people will give you money based on that, and you're like, hey, I'm gonna build this, I'm gonna build this company. And the thing is, like, you're then incentivized to get more and more users, you know, of course, but you're not really incentivized, at least in the earlier stages, to actually make, you know, make the thing that you're going to start making money money out, out of. And so people say, well, how are you going to make how are you going to make money? What's your business model? And you say, oh, it's SaaS, and that's coming later. And one of the problems is that people don't spend enough energy on like what are the real differentiators in our SaaS service? What are the things that like that we can do? that because of how we're deploying, because of how we're building, like what are the things that we can do that that are that are unique? And then and then when you when you do that, when you kind of innovate on the service side, it's a lot harder for an AWS to come along and just sort of like spin up uh, spin up a, com a competing service. And it's really hard as a as an open source company if you're if you're um, to spend a lot of money and time and energy and thought on that SaaS service when you're just, you know, you're fighting tooth and nail to sort of build a great open source company, which I think one of the exciting things that we've did sort of at, at Mother Duck is because we are working very, very closely with the, with the open source DuckDB team. The open source DuckDB team is focused on building a great open source database. And we realize, hey, no, we have to, we have to build, we have to build a real differentiated service and we have to get people to pay us uh, even if they can, even if they can sort of clone at least the open source, the open source components of it. Um, but if, if you look at some of the other, uh, you know, companies building on top of open source that are that are doing that are doing this well, you know, you look at like Neon DB, um, Planet Scale, uh, you know, they don't actually own the the they don't drive the open source projects themselves, but they have found a way to to build a really kind of compelling service uh, on top of 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 kind of more pure open source. Another growing trend that we see uh, from the one thing from the data on Kubernetes research report is about how the fastest growing workloads in terms of new workloads making their way onto Kubernetes are AI and ML. And in one of the talks uh, previously from Dominique, I don't know if he's still here, that was really cool. Um, he, you know, he was speaking about, about machine learning workloads, also AI. But if we're talking about database as a service, what's the effect here overall that, that AI is providing for databases and in terms of their use cases? Oded, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so a year ago I said that in a year, all databases will have uh, vector search. I think that, uh, I, I kind of think that I'm, I'm right. Um, even Dragonfly now uh, have a vector search. I have another prediction. Uh, I think, uh, and I, I, I wonder what's your opinion on that. I, I think that uh, in a few years, there's, there will not be any database that does only vector search. Okay, this is like, uh, for me, vector search now is like uh, an operator in the database. It's like uh, an equal sign or uh, greater than. Uh, there will be no database uh, in the future that supports only an equal sign. <laughs> um, so, so that's that. This, this is how I think AI is and ML is, is changing the database world. Um, but I think that uh, basically the, the the role of a database does, didn't change uh, because of uh, AI or ML. Uh, it's still the predominant way to store data and to retrieve it uh, and to get statistics out of it. Um, I don't think that anyone here would like uh, an ML model to calculate the balance in the bank or something like that, right? Um, having said that, the, there are many other uh, small things uh, that are changing with uh, AI. So. Um, SQL as a language, 
I'm, I'm not sure about it. Like, uh, I'm sure that it will be in the back end, um, but maybe it will be more natural, natural language in order to query databases. Uh, also, database optimization. This is something that uh, AI and ML models would be able to do uh, better, like uh, query optimization. Um, but I really like to hear your opinion maybe about uh, like uh, vector search uh, databases in the future. Yeah, I was actually thinking um, there's a lot of graph databases, like Neo4j, for instance. I was just looking at some of the stuff they're doing. I think they're optimizing for, for AI and for ML. Um, you know, I, so I think, I, I think we said earlier, there's a bunch of different types of databases up here represented from the companies that we work at. And I think somebody said it in an earlier presentation. There's, you know, you need to figure out like what's your use case to figure out like what database and what type of database you want. What is there, like 300 database companies out there? Um, but one of the things, I actually looked up a couple of companies. I don't know if you've worked with um, Apache Flink or um, Debezium or like some of the stuff Red Panda and um, Decodable is doing because right now the amount of data that AI and ML is producing and the amount of you know real time queries that people want to start running against these I mean we're talking billions and billions of of records um, and transactions like per second even if you're talking about financial institutions and some of the other really really big applications that are out there so I think you know if someone has is figuring out and I think some of those companies that I or some of those projects the first two were open source projects um, Apache Flink and Debezium what they're trying to do is help these platforms be able to actually manage and run those large queries against um, this real-time data that's coming in. Uh, so I think this is a, a new and exciting part of the industry. I don't know if, if you have other thoughts on that. So I, what, I, I really agree with, uh, with this uh, concept that I don't think there will be um, in the future just a database that just have the vector search. I think uh, I mean, we at Seja, we have, we target as a persona, the builder, and we see now the majority of companies that are creating now, they are building AI, um, AI application or in the AI space. And I think it, that's why I think this is one of the reasons why all these database companies, they need to have and they invest in having an AI component. Um, and currently, most of this, uh, um, um, most of the users are looking for vector search, um, but I think in the future they will uh, have to add more functionality in order to make a user experience uh, for for the users, right? In in order to have uh, out of the box experience. So currently, in order to, for example, to store embeddings, so I think this is uh, the first step um, in order to have vector search. Uh, but currently, in order to have embeddings, you need to have an extra code. Uh, you need to have extra code to kind of split all the text into small chunks and then um, basically compute embeddings by using LLM. And I think that would be the next step uh, that databases will, will go after, basically um, go in the direction of getting more functionality uh, from frameworks like uh, Llama Index or Langchain in order to kind of, you know, improve the experience for, for main customers that have built applications on top of AI. I also think that AI is, um, is an area where if you're building databases as a service, you can really differentiate on top, of, on top of just pure open source. If you're building, you know, interesting AI, AI features inside, inside your database, um, you know, those are things that you can say, hey, this is what's, this is why it's, this is why it's better, this is why it's easier to use, this is why it's faster, more optimized, et cetera, than, um, than, than what you could do if you're trying to do this, trying to do this on your own, or if you're trying to do this on your own, maybe, maybe even the AI components are open sourced, but it's just a lot more work to, uh, to tie, tie things together. Um, on the analytics side, we've already seen that, you know, people are changing how they're doing their, doing their analytics, they're doing their job, just as it's similar to, you know, GitHub Copilot is changing how developers are doing their jobs. Um, you know, people are already starting to, you know, use, use ChatGPT and other, other mechanisms to sort of, hey, how do I get the SQL for this? Can I, can you fix the SQL for this? Can you, uh, so I think that every, every database is going to be incorporating, um, incorporating AI features. And then I think the big, the big question that I think Oded, Oded alluded to was, um, 
okay, at the end of the day, you know, what do, what's the language that people end up end up using to to interface? Uh, do we like do people like save you know save save English text in their DBT scripts instead of uh, instead of SQL? Um, you know, will it be reliable enough that uh, that uh, you can just describe what you're doing in in English? Um, I'm not sure we'll get there, but um, it'll at least be an interesting interesting journey. I think there's also lots of interesting things where you know, hey, you know, you're using you're using this AI to kind of make people better at their jobs rather than saying, oh, we're just you know, we're gonna we're gonna sort of do away with SQL. SQL is is a lot of people have tried to kill SQL, and uh, and so far it's uh, it's still still raining uh, pretty pretty strong. Never kill SQL. Um, just improve it. <laughs> just that that's the that's the issue. Uh, maybe I would like to add uh, something else. Um, inference is expensive. It's expensive for all those models to run behind the scenes like uh, GPUs. So I also think that. Uh, a lot of databases would uh, need to increase uh, memory and caching in order to uh, store all those um, inference results. So we will not need to like uh, burn calories or burn uh, fuel to generate uh, again and again the same answers. So okay. that's another thing that uh, I think would, would change in, in databases to the future. All right. In terms of other trends that we're seeing in the Kubernetes ecosystem, because obviously AI is one of them. We've seen this, you know, across KubeCons, we see, you know, the, the different trends that are coming in, whether it's, you know, software supply chain, uh, you know, AI being mentioned, things around chat GPT. Multi-cloud is still a very strong trend um, in the Kubernetes ecosystem. In terms of building uh, proper data uh, infrastructure, sorry, for uh, multi-cloud environments, what are things that are catching your attention with it? Maybe Jordan will start. Okay, go for it. Um, I, mean, I think actually, like it, you know, multi-cloud is is super important. I think there's some interesting things where, uh, you know, it's not just you know being in in a certain cloud or another, but can you actually uh, make it so that users don't have to even care where the where the data is? Is is this in GCP? Is this in AWS? Is this in US East One versus versus EU whatever you know four or whatever? Um, there are there are cases where people absolutely care. Like my data is not allowed to leave Germany or Australia or Singapore, but for cases where you know, but you can you can apply constraints um, to force that to happen. And cases where people don't care, like the data and computation should be able to run anywhere. And sh and particularly like you know, people want lower latency to the end user. Can you actually push this closer? Push the work closer to where to where the actual users are. Uh, you know, running and then you know the the edge running in um, uh, you know in telcos uh, running in the you know whatever data center is is actually the lowest lat latency to the user, uh, and I think once you start to do that, it opens up lots of kind of interesting interesting opportunities to sort of build services around this stuff. No, and I think to your point on um, like where you're, do it really does matter when I polled a bunch of people earlier and asked, what do you want to hear about on this panel? Um, data residency, data locality, or like probably the most answer to the question, scalability, of course. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you, maybe not US East, <laughs> and that's the one that seems to go down the most, for good reasons, by the way, not, not just ripping on um, Amazon. I think they got all the hardware first, and they, it break, everything breaks. That's what happens, right? So, um, so having a multi-region solution is not just important for data locality requirements like GDPR, but also for, um, obviously, resiliency. And, um, and you know, you, if latency, really, there's going to be a trade-off, is I guess the point I'm getting to. Because if latency really, really, really does matter, I mean, we've had customers say, I don't care, I am running everything in US East 1 because I need the absolute lowest latency, I'm willing to take the risk of if it goes down. And people might, it depends on what your business model is, right? Um, others, n not a chance, you know? And you have a lot more use cases like, um, you know, online gambling is a huge one and where the data has to be and where the um, workloads have to be. And also like in-game betting, you know, you, you're watching the World Cup. I know you're watching the World Cup. You start betting on like penalty kicks per kick, but you live in Australia, but your data center's in Malta because they all are in Malta, right? They have to be. And um, I had to throw that for my Maltese friend over there. But uh, you cannot miss that, that kick, right? You can't have that transaction not happen. So you have to set up your environments in ways that you're going to be able to you know, make these use cases possible. So what's the right use case for you? And then 
pick the technology that will support that. And SQL's not going away, by the way. I, I'm a big fan of SQL and distributed SQL, um, especially where I just spent the last three years getting my head wrapped around, and it's really cool stuff. Um, and, and NoSQL's really cool, too. So it's, again, pick your poison. Um, what I would like to add uh, to this is that I think one of the challenges of having multi-cloud is that you need to really have uh, to you have to synchronize the data uh, between uh, different cloud providers, and I think this is uh, you mentioned the Basium, which I was a bit surprised earlier. You, I don't know if you are familiar with this. Uh, basically, allows you to uh, copy data and to replicate the data and synchronize the data. But I think the biggest problem with Dubasium is that um, it only replicates the data, but it doesn't replicate the schema or the views uh, or uh, function definitions. So uh, basically, this is something that we are working at Zeta. We are building a new uh, kind of application, a new, uh, we call it internally PG stream. It will be allowed, it will be uh, released soon that also does that. So if you are, curious or if you want to, uh, if you have any issues with Debasium and would like to share with me, I would love to hear about that. Cool. I want to ch touch uh, a few things that were said here. I, I think that uh, as data companies, we have a responsibility uh, to free the data of, of uh, our users. So basically, um, Clouds are great machines to offer uh, CPU, memory, and storage. Um, Kubernetes is built on top of that to build an um, uh, orchestration layer on top of that. Um, and now you can move uh, from cloud to cloud with your uh, computation uh, mainly, but storage still remains uh, the predominant like um, um, uh, place where, that you cannot move from cloud to cloud. So the data is not yours to move. Uh, and it's our responsibility as data companies to actually make your data um, uh, portable. So you'll be able to move between the clouds and then you'll be able to do all those wonderful things like uh, um, going to the lowest latency or going to the lowest cost uh, uh, cloud. Um, the cloud provider them themselves will never offer that, I think. Good. We're getting towards the end. What I, would like to, what I would like to finish with before we have time for questions, I would like each of our panelists to summarize, if you can, in 30 seconds, all right, about from all the things that we've been hearing today, if end users need to be focusing on one thing and one thing only when it comes to, to database as a service in the future, what should that be, all right? So think about all the things that we've heard about um, in today's co-located event. Moving forward, what are, thing, what, is the, what, what are the things that you think people absolutely must have on, your, on their radars? All right, so we can start with you, Jordan. Well, put me on, put me on the spot. Everybody else gets to uh, get to think for another couple minutes, so. I'll... I can ask another question before you answer. <laughs> Sorry, this is wildly inappropriate, but if someone works at Mother Duck, are they a Mother Ducker? Uh. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Sorry. I, okay. Yeah. No. No. We, right, we. You heard it here straight from the source forums. All right. We realized we either had to like you know pretend that we had no idea what any connotations or whatever would be around <laughs> around the name, or we had to just embrace embrace it. So like. I love it. One of our things is embrace the duck. Uh, so yes. Oh yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yep. The hoodie penny. All right. So that being said, thirty seconds. Uh, I think you know, you know, building building databases as a service and using and running databases as a service. I think um, it, um, it's it's uh, you know really key to have a great uh, great relationship with the sort of the open source open source team. We're very very much uh, fans of uh, of open source, and I think we've sort of built built a unique model in uh, in how we've uh, how we've done this with the with the DuckDB team, and that we're hoping that if uh, if you know things work out at Mother Duck, the, the people will be like, "Hey, that's a good way to do it." If it doesn't, people, uh, you know, maybe maybe we have taken one taken one for the collective team. Um, but you know, having basically the the core DuckDB team who's built uh, built the open source, they actually own part of Mother Duck. So if things work out for us, it'll work out for them, and that helps keep them aligned with what we're doing. But on the other hand, they they keep the IP pure, and they kind of have the DuckDB foundation that we don't have any have any control over. 
um, and uh, and I think I'm hoping that this is a good a good um, a good model for uh, for open source in the future. All right, Monica, twenty seconds. No pressure. <laughs> So what I, I think it's interesting because um, we are kind of different type of databases here, and I think uh, uh, what I'll encourage people uh, is to um, kind of, you know, when you build a data platform, when you're building application, basically you need multiple data source um, to, and then, you know, you have to replicate your data. You have to synchronize the data between them. So I think it's really important to use the data store uh, that is right for you um, for the use case uh, that you have. For example, if you, for example, if you want search, probably you need something like Elasticsearch. Uh, if you want transactional database, probably you want to go with Postgres or something that implements a Postgres wire protocol. Uh, if you want, uh, so I think there's always. Um, yeah, I think that's my takeaway on this. Okay, thank you. I think there's a, um, a statistic in wine, I used to be in the wine industry, saying if you put an animal on your label, you have 25% more chance of somebody actually picking your wine. I think that applies to databases too. If I'm looking around at this panel, there's a lot of flying, cute flying um, insects and, and ducks and cockroaches and dragonflies. So um, choose your database based on the animal on the label. But um, also I'll just use a little data-driven point here. If anybody's afraid of running database as a service, um, I, first I would say don't be because you know, this is the future of databases service panel, but um, it's actually here if anyone is thinking it's not. And we, even the largest banks in the world who swore two and a half years ago that they would never move everything to the cloud or even anything to the cloud are moving a lot of workloads to the cloud. So don't be afraid of it. There's lots of ways to solve the problem. Um, and just in case, you know, we'll use data to prove the point. I looked up some Gartner statistic numbers. This database as a service was a 10, $0.4 billion industry in 2018, which was 23% share of, um, of the whole database management um, industry. And last year, Gartner published that it's a $40 billion um, industry, which is half of the $80 billion database management market. Um, so don't be afraid of it. It's here. There's lots of companies that are doing it really, really, really well. Um, and again, just pick the workload that you're going to run in the cloud and start there. All right, cool. We got one more minute. Oh, then. I won't use the minute, I'll use 20 seconds. Um, think about, I encourage you to think about your users, what do they want from your service, and then uh, your team, how are they going to support the scale that you need in order to service those, uh, those users. And I think that uh, um, handling now on your own uh, databases is uh, too complex, and you would like to take uh, responsible professional companies to do it for you. Very, very good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Good job, everybody. We got time for questions, correct? Any questions? We have Alex? a question. So, I'm not sure there's an answer to this question, but I'm curious to see what the panel is saying. We've moved our open source from some combination of commercializing it with professional services and support and open core with enterprise add-ons. And over the last couple of years, we've just moved to actually having SaaS as the business model, right? Where, where we're selling it as a service instead and it's ease of use and, and all of those things. And AI and machine learning is probably going to drive that more because it's hard to run those things yourself and you're going to want to consume those as a service. So does... Do SaaS providers now drive open source strategy, or does open source strategy need to define SaaS providers? And, and where do the foundations fit in, in all this? Uh, I, I can take at least, take a stab at least at least the first part because I think that um, um, that I think SaaS is a great model for open source because I think there was if you're trying to sell uh, services, you're trying to sell. Um, you know, some sort of on-prem software, there's always a tension between what you can release as part of the open source core versus what goes in the, the enterprise, enterprise version. The, you know, you want to give more to the community. On the other hand, you, you, you need to have a, an actual business. And I think by putting it behind a SaaS boundary, it gives you a, the opportunity to basically, you know, uh, 
charge people for it without them thinking, well, what are you actually providing as, as value? Because like, if they were gonna run it themselves in an EC2 uh, instance, like, they'd have to pay for it, they'd have to pay for it anyway, and chances are you can do it you know, more, you know, less expensively and uh, by using multi-tenancy, and then also it lets you kind of do a bunch of behind the scenes, behind the scenes innovation. So I think that it can help I can ex help accelerate open source by by saying, hey, th there's a really a really viable um, business model for, um, for for doing this by by building by building SaaS, and you don't have the same kinds of like uh, divided um, incentives. Yeah, I, I was nodding all along like this, uh, and and I, I very much agree. With, like currently, what uh, I'm seeing is that uh, SaaS is driving uh, open source or BSA licenses or, or licenses like this. Um, we are at the stage where we find a business model that can sponsor those. Uh, I, I think that there's uh, almost no difference between uh, the community version of the product and the, the service, other than um, our ability as a service to optimize cost, our ability as a service to, um, to simplify the service that is provided. And I think that this is the main value that uh, the SaaS uh, contributes on top of uh, the open source. It's, it's no longer an open core in most cases um, because almost all of the uh, source and all of the features are out there. Um, so the traditional way of open source is that you create an open source project, become successful, and then you build a SaaS offering. Uh, in my case, we did it the other way around, um, in, the, in the sense that uh, we started with the SaaS um, and we are open sourcing some parts of the, of the product that makes sense to be used uh, as a standalone project and solve a specific pain point. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is I think many people don't realize this, but being in, I was in an open source space for, I don't know, 10 years or so, um, Running an open source company or an open source project kind of it's a lot of uh, work no, it because isn't. <laughs> uh, because you need to you know besides you know dealing with the community uh, but you also have to uh, build packages for different distributions and so on so uh, in my opinion it kind of adds up forty uh, percent uh, of your resources. So what I'm trying to do with Sage is we try to concentrate all our resources in building features uh, for users instead of you know going on, on the route of uh, building packages and so on in order to kind of build uh, features that kind of makes uh, make uh, the life of the developers easier and allows us to move faster uh, with uh, uh, you know with with the product. Um, you cannot imagine at Elastic how complex our spreadsheets were. This version work with this version, and don't even uh, get into account, you know, all the distributions uh, and so on. So definitely, I think it has a huge advantage uh, having a SaaS offering, um, and we are betting for that. Okay, yeah. time for one more question. We got we got to cut it. All right, well, we have the excuse to continue the conversation uh, once, we, once we finish up. I want to say thanks again to our panelists. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> also, shout outs to all the people who put the event together. It's the first time they're doing this. I hope it's not the last. Um, so thank you very much, and let's keep going.